Next up, we have another plenary, and to share this, I'd like to invite Dr. S. Prem Krishna, a consultant anesthetist. So. Uh, good morning and welcome to the plenary series two. The topic for this series is clinical challenges in mechanical ventilation. The speaker for this lecture is Dr. Vasmadi Devanesan, consultant anesthetist, teaching hospital at Japna. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vasmadi Devanesan to this forum. She received primary education in Urumbrai Sandrodia Vidyal Salai and secondary education in Bermbadi Girls High School. She obtained her MBBS from Faculty of Medicine, University of Japna, and obtained MD in anesthesiology from Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. She is trained in anesthesia in Colombo and UK. She is the coordinator and the director for CPR courses. She is very passionate about CPR training. Her special interests are critical care, difficult airway management, and anesthesia for complex surgeries. And over to you, Dr. Vasmadi Dhamanesh. Thank you, Dr. Prema Krishna, for the kind introduction. Good day to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Jaffna Medical Association, the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity to talk about this hot topic in this pandemic. My topic today is clinical challenges in mechanical ventilation. Ventilator management warrants close attention because inappropriate ventilation can result in injury to the lungs and the respiratory muscle. It can itself worsen the morbidity and mortality. So, what are the challenges of ventilating a patient mechanically? If you consider the challenges, the challenges are a lot. I can't talk about all the challenges within these uh, 25 minutes or 30 minutes. But if you see, if we are going to ventilate a patient in an established ICU with uh, all the sophisticated equipments and the personnel, including 24-7, one is to one ratio nursing officers, they are well trained with the um, medical officers who are also well trained in the uh, intensive care management, with the multidisciplinary team looking after the ICU with the intensivist, with very less occupational hazards for the healthcare personnel is entirely different from ventilating a patient in the makeshift ICUs or in the ward setup. I'm not going to discuss about these system or yesterday somebody was talking about six syst systems in Rome or something like this. The system plays a major role in ventilating a patient and the success. I'm not going to talk about this. This is not the scope of my lecture. What I'm going to talk now is what are the major clinical challenges we will face when we are ventilating a patient. These are the major challenges. I would say there are so many, but I would like to uh, say the major ones or I will highlight the major ones. First one is avoiding intubation or in other terms, establishing non-invasive mechanical ventilation if the clinical condition of the patient permits. Second one is maintaining adequate gas exchange or in other words, managing hypoxia or severe resistant hypoxia. Third one is while managing this gas exchange, protecting the lung diaphragm and the airway. How to protect and how to uh, keep their normal function during the ventilation. Fourth one is 
how to wean off the patient from the ventilator or the challenges we face liberating the patient from the mechanical ventilation. First one, the avoiding intubation. I don't think I have to explain the problems of intubation. If I ask you uh, or, or someone looking over there to intubate the patient, I know definitely that person, if, if he is not or she is not well trained enough, will call for a skilled person, anesthetist or medical officer from the intensive care unit. That itself explains this intubation needs some skill. That means if you need some skill, that means that procedure has some problems or complications or challenges. It is not just like putting a blood pressure cuff and measuring the blood pressure. If you, have, if you want to intubate a patient, you have to give some sort of sedation or induction agent. You have to use some muscle relaxant. You have to use your laryngoscope. You have to get a good view of the vocal cords. And you have to put the tube down into the correct place, not in the esophagus. It should be in the trachea. And once you put the tube down, your duty is not over there. It is a foreign body. The patient will try to expel it out all the time. So you have to keep that. You have to anchor and you have to keep the tube inside the trachea. For that, you can't do it in the ward. Then you have to move to the ICU. So you know the consequences of in, after intubating the patient, managing the patient is facing so many challenges. So how can you avoid that one? If you have the clinical condition, if your patient's clinical conditions permits, these patients can be managed with the non-invasive ventilation, then you can overcome the challenges of intubation. So what are the, uh, when I'm talking about the clinical conditions, about non-invasive ventilation, you all know during this pandemic more about the non-invasive ventilation. I don't have to talk a lot. Briefly, what is non-invasive in a ventilation is we don't put the tube down, but we have to connect the patient to the uh, ventilator with the interface. That is a face mask, well-fitting face mask connecting over the face, occluding the nose and uh, mouth and connecting that one to the patient. Via this method, we can give B BiPAP or CPAP. Or nowadays, this high-flow nasal cannula also considered as a non-invasive ventilation. Though it looks simple and you can avoid uh, intubation, the non-invasive ventilation has its limitations and the challenges. For example, you can't uh, succeed all the patients with the non-invasive ventilation. Well-proven uh, indications are exacerbation of chronic pulmonary obstructive airway disease, COPED, and the pulmonary edema. During this pandemic, you are well aware that COVID pneumonia, to some extent, can be managed with the non-invasive ventilation. Second important challenge is optimizing gas exchange. You all know gas exchange, that is taking the oxygen in and letting out the carbon dioxide out. That is the main function of the respiratory system. To start with, if we if I touch a little bit of physiology, what happens in normal person, it is called oxygen cascade. Uh, we all breathe. We create a negative pressure when we breathe in. That is, it is in order to make a pressure gradient from environment to lungs. So there is a pressure drop over the, from environment to alveoli. There is a pressure drop. So air will flow from higher pressure to lower pressure. Once it enters the alveoli, it will be diffused into the, into the blood. And in the blood, the partial pressure of oxygen will determine how much oxygen is taken, is going to be taken up by the hemoglobin to cause saturation. This is the basic physiology. So ultimately, what is important is the PaO2, because this pressure gradient is very important to develop this PAO. PAO2 means partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. If we have the pressure gradient, we will get PA, adequate PAO, PAO2. Right? So what is this partial pressure of oxygen then? 
or oh, what are the factors contributing this partial pressure is not only the pressure gradient it is the pressures and the fractional concentration of oxygen right fractional concentration this partial pressure of oxygen inside the uh, blood vessel depends on mainly two factors one is fio2 other one is pressures how we can measure this is by measuring the oxygen saturation that is uh, partial pressure of oxygen will fill the hemoglobin and will give you the saturation so we can measure this oxygenation by measuring the uh, saturation or by by doing arterial blood gas analysis we can uh, we we can have a value of the pao2 right so how are we going to treat this hypoxia i have made it very simple though it is not very simple it is very complicated for the understanding the pao2 or partial pressure of oxygen depend on two factors one is fio2 and other one is the pressure right fio2 you all know in the room here it is the oxygen concentration is little bit less than 21% that is good enough for us to breathe in and out and even in a strenuous exercise the normal fio2 what is found in the air is good enough but in disease condition it is not so for due to various reason so what we can do is we can increase this fractional concentration of oxygen this is what we call as oxygen therapy and our all the sophisticated or the basic ventilators are able to provide this fio2 up to 100% we don't say it is 100% it you have to say one but we are very familiar with the percentage so it is up to 100% you can increase other one is these pressures partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is depend on one is fio2 other one is pressures right what we do with pressures with the ventilators as i told you the physiological basis or the normal breathing is negative pressure ventilation we all create a negative pressure in the pleura because of the pressure gradient it comes in but what we do or what we do in mechanically ventilating is we are applying a pressure from the outside that is we are giving a positive pressure that is in order to give the create this pressure gradient so that is why this pre positive pressure ventilation develop actually this is this has been there for centuries but it developed further that uh, positive pressure ventilation develop more and more during the epidemic of poliomyelitis you all know they started with the iron lung then it is in develop the positive pressure ventilation develop nowadays also we are using this positive pressure ventilation and we are using so many terms regarding this pressure like positive end expiratory pressure peep cpap bipap Uh, driving pressure peak pressure plateau pressure so many thing all these are mainly to overcome to this partial pressure of oxygen and increase the hypoxia with the sophisticated ventilator but as i have simplified that we have one and the low partial pressure uh, decided by two factors pressures and fio2 and on the other end we have the high end ventilators nowadays with the all the facilities to provide the 100% oxygen and the, all these pressures it looks simple that we can easily ventilate a patient is it that simple yes in some patients like post operative patient their lungs are normal so if you if you have to give little bit of oxygen little bit of pressure you can ventilate or simple pneumonia so some disease condition with little bit of pathology it's easy with playing with the pressures and the fio2 you can ventilate the patient but in conditions like respiratory distress syndrome acute respiratory distress syndrome or nowadays the Uh, most difficult areas that covid pneumonia with the cards the lungs are not normal what happens here because of the so many various pathophysiological reasons 
the membrane between the alveoli and the blood vessels, that is endothelium, epithelium are damaged and they create more and more difficult pathology inside the lung. The lung becomes homogeneous. There are pneumonia part, atelectitis part, pulmonary edema part, and so many pathologies in one lung in, at one time. That means the lung is no longer homogeneous. So your simplified terms like FiO2 and pressures are just simply will not work out. That is why we struggle treating this hypoxia in COVID or in severe ARDS patients. For that, we need to understand more about this pathophysiology of COVID pneumonia or ARDS in addition to the basic principles of ventilation to succeed in their ventilation. So what we can do is there are already because I told you that positive pressure ventilation has been developing over the past 40 years after the poliomyelitis now 60 years. With that, there are uh, so many recommendations, so many studies, ARDS network studies and so many studies. There are uh, well-proven techniques how to overcome, how to ventilate these patients. So we have to adhere to these recommended techniques when we are ventilating these patients. What are those established evidences? They have established prone ventilation, ventilation with high PEEP strategy, and some more they have, it is not, though even it is not well proven, you have, you can use the prone ventilation, PEEP, and you have to avoid the high PEEP pressure, you have to you can use muscle relaxant in order to make the ventilation or asynchrony, avoid the asynchrony. And the other one are lung recruitment methods you can use. These are some well-established techniques in ARDS to increase the oxygenation, right? This is the well, very well-established uh, method of ventilating a patient that is prone ventilation. It looks very easy. You don't need much equipment. You are just putting the patient on the pillows upside down. And these are the physiological basis that is mainly it improves the VQ mismatch because it increasing the ventilation to the non-affected part more and increasing the circulation that is alleviating the VQ mismatch. It, it, it improves the VQ mismatch that is the most important area it tackles. In addition, the, it enhances the secretion mobilization and it, the gravity of the heart and the stomach is away from the lung so it can be easily ventilated. So it looks very easy. In CBA ARDS patient, if you put the patient on prone position, you can improve oxygenation. And it, in so many studies, it is well proven you can do a lot. Even during this pandemic, everybody is promoting about this prone ventilation. So why we are underusing this? Why we are not using? These are challenges we face when ventilating this CBA ARDS patient. If you see this picture, it is very obvious. What is the most important thing here? We need more personnel. This is not just like one an intensivist or anesthetist and the respiratory physician can do with the one nursing officer. This is the most difficult challenge we face. Though it looks like very simple, the challenge is very difficult, with the, especially with the COVID pandemic and healthcare workers. Uh, uh, risk of contaminating or contagious problem, it is very difficult to get this manpower for put the patient on the prone position. And it is not just only turning the patient down. You have to look after the ventilatory settings and the ARVs, everything in the prone position needs continuous monitoring and continuous assessment and continuous 
intervention as and when needed. For that, we need manpower. It is really we need at least one is to one nursing officer inside the intensive care to look after the patient in the prone positioning. And apart from these well proven techniques and the prone positioning, if fails and difficult resistant hypoxia in ARDS, so CARS, we could manage, it can further accelerate the oxygen therapy by using ECMO, that is called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, Renuka has nicely described about the cardiac bypass machines. This is almost same. This is because our lung or the pathway from ventilator to the blood is affected in because of the ARDS and severe lung pathology. So oxygen can't enter through the lung. So what we can do is it is almost like a cardiac bypass by, uh, machine. It, this is we take some blood out and extracorporeal in the uh, circulation outside the body, we oxygenate the blood. This is actually venovenous and send back the oxygenation, oxygenated blood to the patient. It looks, the principles are very basic, simple, but you know what are the complications of extracorporeal circulation and consequences. But still, we can do it. I think it may be the high time to get down one ECMO machine, one or two ECMO machine to our part of the country also. We have in Karapatiya in Sri Lanka. Third one, third one, most important thing is, uh, I discuss about avoiding intubation and establishing non-invasive ventilation. Other one is gas exchange, that is the most difficult part. When we are achieving or when we are struggling to ventilate or oxygenate this patient, what we do is we tend to traumatize our lungs. When we are using high tidal volume frequencies, high pressures, and continuous ventilation, everything will can cause injuries to lung. Ventilation is not without any complications, like any procedures, any treatment has side effects. So many people will ask about these vaccine side effects and why we can't take, why we should we have to take, but I have not seen any public is asking about these complications of ventilators. We have so many complications and limitations. So we have during achieving this oxygenation, we have to prevent the lung from over distending and over distension and the result, resulting traumas like atelectroma, barotrauma, biotrauma and volutrauma and associated other injuries and injuries due to hyperoxia that is overzealous increasing the SPO, uh, PAO2 also not good for the lungs. So for that also like oxygenation there are well proven strategies to ventilate this patient to prevent the lung injuries. Those are use low tidal volume. That is 6 ml per kg, not the high or the normal values of the tidal volume. Here, even though the ventilation is mainly for wash out the carbon dioxide, our aim is to oxygenate the patient. Oxygenation is the main concern. As far as the acidosis permits, that is called permissive hypercapnia, you can go down on the uh, uh, tidal volume and go for low tidal volume. Don't go for the huge or normal uh, tidal volume. It is injurious to the ARDS lung. And other preventing measures are look after your pressures. Pressures are good for to increase the PaO2, but if you, it is more, it will cause barotrauma. And prone positioning also, recommended technique is 16 hours per day, then you have to turn back and do all your other cares for ventilation. Driving pressures less than 50, high pressure, uh, peep pressure, high peep, as long as your cardiovascular system is supporting you, you can increase the peep. There are different strategies to increase the peep. That is not the scope of this lecture. So, Preventing lung injury is most important while oxygenation 
and most neglected part nowadays all have these after this ARDS network studies and so many studies we are aware of this lung protection. But most of the people tend to forget about this diaphragm or the respiratory muscle dysfunction. It is a skeletal muscle. As you all know, if you don't use the skeletal muscle for some time, it will get disuse atrophy or it will not function normally. The same way the respiratory muscles and the diaphragm are same. In order to maintain the oxygenation, if you give deep sedation and give some muscle relaxation to make the synchro best synchrony with the ventilator, then what will happen is you will lose the respiratory muscles normal function. That is not good because you can't be enough. You, you might ventilate very successfully, you will get a good oxygenation, your pathology will settle. Once everything is settled, if you try to take over the ventilation, your respiratory muscles are not there to support you to wean off the patient from the ventilator. So how can we alleviate that problem from the start? It is not like anesthesia, just induce, put some muscle relaxant, put the tube down, when the surgery is over, you can't take it out. In the ICUs, we ventilate the patient for days, weeks, and sometimes months. If you continuously give deep sedation and muscle relaxant, once the muscles become atrophied, then you can't be know. So what you have to do is from the beginning, you have to let the patient to breathe. Our sophisticated ventilators are able to provide not only the mandatory ventilation, they will support all the patients, most of the patient's efforts. We have so many modes to support these efforts, like most important one is uh, uh, SIMB mode. You all are very familiar with this SIMB mode. That means it is synchronous with the patient's effort. Whenever the patient take a breath, if it is coming under its windows, it will support. Other respiratory efforts will be suppressed. So that means you keep your respiratory muscle, especially the diaphragm, to function continuously from the start, then taking out from the ventilator or weaning the patient from the ventilator won't be that difficult. Fourth difficult part is weaning from mechanical ventilation. You have done something for the oxygenation, and you have treated conditions and your medical condition, why you have put the tube and why you have started the ventilator. If you can't take it out from that, that is a total failure. No point in ventilating this patient. There are so many criteria to how to wean off these patients and complications. I'm not going to talk about all these things, but the important thing is what first and foremost criteria is we have to uh, wait till the disease condition is back to normal. That's why you have put the tube, so it should not be there. It is no longer like that. It, should, it can be there, but it should be reasonably controlled. If you wait till it is, reasonable, it is treated, you might fail in weaning the patient. If it is reasonably controlled, you have to start off the patient from the... Uh, when, uh, you have to start your weaning. Like you can reduce, you can start reducing the pressures, you can start reducing your FiO2, you can start reducing your sedation, like that. You have to start from the as early as possible. When the disease condition is reasonably well enough, good enough to be controlled, you have to start weaning the patient from the ventilator. Sometimes we may have to uh, take the tube out a little bit early on some non-invasive ventilation. If oxygenation is problem, you can go for CPAP. If your ventilation or carbon dioxide wash out also problem, you can be off the patient on the BiPAP. So I have discussed the major uh, limitations or the challenges we face in ventilating the patients. If I don't touch COVID during this pandemic, uh, it is not good, but I'm not going to talk. I will show you some slides. Evidences are pouring from all over the countries. Read and do. But in my opinion, yes, we have to follow the evidences pouring. We have to read, we have to update it. But don't forget the basics. It is also a kind of ARDS. If you can stick to the ARDS management in addition to adding your knowledge and recommendations, we can do 
more with the COVID patients. So mitigating all these, how to overcome these challenges, as I have discussed earlier, it is uh, not only the oxygen, um, intubation, oxygenation, lung protective ventilation, and weaning. There are more, the system we have to improve. We can't go and we can't ask or we can't demand. We have to get together and we have to work out for this system, how we are going to further manage these patients. And regarding these other four things, what we have to do is we can't just go on like protocolized management. We have to individualize. We have to give a tailor-made ventilation for each and every patient. Then we can overcome these challenges to some extent. Thank you. Thank you, Basmadi for highlighting the challenges in mechanical ventilation and sort the way to overcome these challenges. I think it's a very complicated subject, but uh, you have put it in a very simplified form. Uh, on behalf of Japanese Medical Association, I thank Dr. Vasmati Durbanation for her excellent presentation. Thank you.